welcome to um, videos on or the series of discussions on the law of removable property. I'm sure that as you've watched on the playlist on our YouTube channel, if you go to the playlist, you would see the various sections. And I'm sure under that section, you saw the law of removable property, what is usually called land law. And under that, we discuss the series of interest in land. In this particular video, our emphasis or focus is going to be the leasehold interest in land. Under that, we'll discuss a couple of things. Principally among them would be what is the lease and what are the elements or constituents of a lease? What actually is a leasehold interest? So we might have heard about that kind of interest, lease, 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 lease. People say, oh, I want to go and get a lease for a land that I have, I have got somewhere. And they go through some bit of processes. What exactly is a lease? Okay, now to set the discussion ruling into what a lease is, the Lands Act 2020, that is the Act 1036, okay, under Section 6, gives us the first indication by Ghanaian statute or the contemporary Ghanaian statute as to what a lease is. So with much, without much hesitation, I just want us to keep a focus and pay attention to the Section 6 of the Lands Act 1036, where it discusses the leasehold interest. Let's see Section 6. Section 6, leasehold interest. A lease, A, is an interest in land for a duration which is certain or capable of being ascertained. B, arises when a person who holds an allodial title, customary law freehold, common law freehold, or usufractory interest, conveys to another person an interest in land for a specified term subject to terms and conditions. C, may in the case of a sublease or an assignment, arise when the holder of a leasehold interest grants a sublease out of that interest or assigns that interest. And D, does not exhaust the interest of the grantor in the land. Section 6 of the Lands Act 1036 was what I just read to you clearly there. So basically, what do we say? The statute makes mention that a lease is a kind of an interest, okay, that is granted on a land for a, a specified duration or for a time or duration that is capable of ascertainment. Now, this may be done by the alluvial title holder or usufractory title holder or any of the other interest holders that the Lands Act talks about on uh, some agreed terms and conditions. And it goes on to say that it does not take away the rights or the interest of the grantor. It doesn't extinguish the interest of the grantor. So that is what the statute mentions. At least from the Lands Act 1036, Section 6, we realize a very key component there. When an interest in land or a right in land is granted to somebody, okay, for a certain duration or a duration that is capable of ascertainment under stipulated terms and conditions, at least a lease arises in there. Now, so we see or we can safely say that the indicia or the constituents of a lease will include one, a determinate term or a term that is capable of duration. We'll come to that shortly. Also, you would realize that the act or, or the statute also mentioned under Section 6 that it should be on some agreed terms and conditions. Usually, these terms or conditions bring us to the second point. That is, the requirement or a condition to pay rent on it. So we have one, the certainty of duration or a determinate term. Two, we have conditions that involves rent, or we can say payment of rent. Now, there is another significant feature of lease that is inherent in it. Though the statute does not make mention of it expressly and under that, much of judicial pronouncement on case law, on leases, have given us an indication or goes with the, or, or is consistent with the idea of what a lease is. What is that particular requirement? Now, that requirement is what we call the right of exclusive possession. The right of exclusive possession. We'll come to that shortly. So principally, when we talk about the components of a lease, we are saying that there has to be one, the right of exclusive possession, okay? Two, there should be a determinate term or a term that is capable of ascertainment. And third, further conditions that involves or that may involve the payment of rent. So in some authorities or literature, Leases are defined, or a lease is defined as the grant of the right of exclusive possession 
into a piece of land for a determinate term under agreed terms and other conditions. Are we okay? I take that again. The right of grant or the grant of a right to exclusive possession in land for a determinate term on further agreed terms and conditions. That is what constitutes a lease. Now, in a very famous common law case, which we call Street versus Manford. Now, this is some of the brief facts of the case to just help you get it. Mrs. Manford, okay, had, had an agreement with somebody to grant the person some part of space in her house for some amount or for, for, for some, some kind of rent. Now, when they did the agreement, it was there in the agreement that they intended to have that agreement not being a lease, but what they call a license. Then later, there was some dispute that had arisen in the course of the, the arrangement or the tenancy. The matter went to the court. It traveled way up to the, high, the, up to the superior courts in England, that is the House of Lords. And the House of Lords made some, some, made some kind of pronouncement. And these pronouncements were very fundamental or is fundamental to understanding of leases. Now, before I go back to the Street versus Mountford case, I talk about uh, the, the first requirement, that is the right to exclusive possession. What do we mean by the right to exclusive possession? What is that? Now, you see, the right to exclusive possession simply means that the right of the lessee or the person who has been granted the lease to enjoy the space in a manner that, that is consistent with the nature of a landlord. You understand that? So if you have the lessee or the tenant enjoying the land in a manner that is consistent as a way of, or in a manner that is consistent like he, he is kind of exercising rights like an owner, we say that it is the, we call that the right to exclusive possession. Now, Lord Templeman, who was one of the justices in the Street versus Mountford case, gave a very informative and stunning piece of um, dicta in that particular street versus Manford. That gives us a bit of understanding on what uh, the right of exclusive possession is. Now let's look at uh, let's look at Lord Templeman's statement in Street versus Manford. A tenant possessing exclusive possession is able to exercise the rights of an owner of land, which is in the real sense his land, albeit temporarily and subject to certain restrictions. A tenant armed with exclusive possession can keep out strangers and keep out the landlord. So that is the point, that when you have the right of exclusive possession being said to be vested in a tenant, we are saying that the tenant has the right to exclude everybody, including the landlord, from the use of the land. That is, the tenant can use the land like his own, like an owner. So there may, be, there may be certain things that ordinarily the owner may, may be able to do. For example, seeking to enforce certain, certain rights against third parties. Let's suppose that someone attempted to trespass onto the land. Okay? The right of exclusive possession the tenant would allow the tenant the right to, for example, take the matter up and report to the police station. He can even go to court to enforce his right or ownership or use of the space. All that is vested in him because he has the right of what? Exclusive possession. Hope you're okay. So the point is this. If a person or the grant of use of a land does not give somebody an exclusive possession, tenancy does not arise. And therefore, leases will not even be present at that particular time. It is important to understand that this is one of the cardinal distinctions between who a tenant is and who a licensee is. Or what makes somebody a tenant, and what makes another person a licensee. The key fact is this. If the right of exclusive possession is granted to the individual by virtue of the lease, it makes him a tenant, all right? But if the right of exclusive possession is not granted in the individual, then the person may have some kind of lesser form of rights, and such kind of lesser forms of rights will include the right of, or let's say, he being a licensee. And remember, licensee just simply means that the person is there on some kind of permission. If there were some other third party who was seeking to encroach on the rights, a licensee would never have the right to, for example, take a legal action against him because he's just there on permission. But for the tenant who has the right of exclusive possession, it constitutes a kind of a legal estate, a right that he can call like his own. 
and therefore he can exercise some kind of authority or enforce some certain kind of rights against third parties. So principally, that is what we mean by um, the right of exclusive possession. It's very, very necessary. So that's the first requirement for, for, for leases. In addition to what the statute has provided under Section 6 of the Lands Act, we are saying that the right of exclusive possession should be the first point that you should be looking at if we are trying to examine whether a particular arrangement that grants right to use of land constitutes a lease. Has the person been given the right to exclude everybody from the use of the land apart from he alone? If that particular right has been given, we are seeing that the right of exclusive possession is there, and hence the person becomes a tenant. Okay, now the point is this. What is the relevance of this for those of us who are probably students and maybe taking an exam in law or mobile property, or maybe as you may be preparing for your Ghana School of Law entrance exam? You need to be alert. Maybe when you, when you are confronted with a, a question in law, okay, a, a, a typical law question about landlord-tenancy relation, and there is a discussion or the facts of the case suggest that maybe A, who purportedly, let's call him a landlord, goes into an agreement to grant the use of rights or right to grant somebody the right to use a particular land or premises. The first key question that we need to ask is whether or not the kind of arrangement that was done between A, the landlord, and B, constitutes what we call a lease. The, what you should be looking out for is that what was the nature of the right of use that was granted to be? Did he have the right of exclusive possession? Did he have the right to use the space like he would, like, like an owner? If you examine the facts and you realize that B has been given that kind of right, where he can exercise control over the property like an owner, that is a right of exclusive possession. And hence, a tenancy is being created there. You can see this particular distinction when you compare that with, uh, for example, someone who goes into a hotel or, or, or like someone who uses a facility in a hotel. Now you see that if someone goes to use a hotel, you realize clearly that the person has not got the right of exclusive possession. Why? Because if you go to the hotel, how the place is cared for, who mops the, who mops the floor, who changes the bed sheet, and even the access to the room. When you leave the hotel room, you have to take the keys and deposit it at the, port, at the porter's section, right? You do that. So all that shows that you do not have the right, to, uh, the right of exclusive possession. That is what, 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 what we mean by we mean by the right of exclusive possession. So again, like I'm saying, in an, examination, it's an exam situation, you should be very easy or you should be alert to trying to see the nature of rights that has been given the person. If the nature of rights is, is of such a category, that it allows the person who has been given the space to exclude the use of other people from it, or he can exercise right like an owner. That is a right of exclusive possession, and it constitutes, um, um, it constitutes um, an indication that the requirement for a lease is being satisfied. Let's go back to Lord Templeman. When he made further statements in, in the Street versus Manford case, that kind of summarizes this particular point that we are mentioning. Again, Lord Templeman in Street versus Manford. There can be no tenancy. Unless the occupier enjoys exclusive possession. But an occupier who enjoys exclusive possession is not necessarily a tenant. He may be owner in fee simple, a trespasser and mortgagee in possession, an object of charity or a service occupier. To constitute a tenancy, the occupier must be granted exclusive possession for a fixed or periodic term, certain in consideration of a premium or periodical payments. So you saw again Lord Templeman trying to emphasize that particular point there, that when you don't have exclusive possession, you are not a tenant. When you don't have a exclusive possession, you are not a tenant. So again, if you analyze your facts and you realize that exclusive possession has not been granted to the individual, he does not become a tenant. But now he, he sounds a certain kind of caution, which is important for practical purposes and also for exam purposes that being granted exclusive possession will also not necessarily make somebody a tenant. So the point is this. There can be no tenancy without exclusive possession. Okay? And the fact that you have exclusive possession does not make you a tenant. It's not the same statement. It's, it's different. So the point is that someone can have exclusive possession and he may not be a tenant. But you cannot be a tenant and not have exclusive possession. So this way goes. A tenant must have exclusive possession. Okay? To be called so as a tenant. But exclusive possession, we don't necessarily make you a tenant. 
because of some other arrangements in there. And he mentions that this may be because the person may be a trespasser. The person may be um, a service occupier. Let me just talk about those two so that we try and get that. Now, this particular statement by, by, by Lord Templeman is exposing us to a certain kind of requirement for the, for the exclusive possession or tenancy. That is a certain intention to create legal relations. I'm sure you may be familiar with this particular concept of intention to create legal relations from the, uh, from the, um, from the, the law of contract, okay? So the intention to create legal relations, as we all know, which means that the two individuals or the parties involved in the contract are of the same mind that they hope or they see the contract to be legally binding upon them. That is, there are rights that the two of them think that they are enforceable at law. That is a kind of an intention to create legal relations in there. Now, bringing back to the Lord Templeman's description or his statement, he mentions that the fact that you may have an exclusive possession will not necessarily make you a tenant because of some particular situations. And that is the intention to create legal relations, though he does not mention that expressly. So see, let's take the case of a trespasser. Someone has a land, okay? He has a land in a particular area. For, let's say, for three or four months, he has not, perhaps because of his busy schedule, he's not be able to go and um, look at the land or whatever. Then someone comes onto the land. Then he begins farming. Perhaps he just wants a place to cultivate his crops. Now, he's farming not because the owner of the land had given him some kind of permission to do that. But he just found a place and he's farming. He's doing everything. In fact, if you don't even know the owner of the land and you go there, you will think that the one who is farming is the owner. The question is, has he not got exclusive possession? Has he not got exclusive possession? He has. Why? He's using the space like an owner would. He's farming the place, he's tilling, he's tilling the land, he's putting up crops, he's doing so many things, he's irrigating the, that. He's exercising exclusive possession onto the land. But the question is that, does that make him a tenant? No. Why? Because there hasn't been any intention to create any legal relation between he, the trespasser, and the real owner. So that is what Lord Templeman is saying, that under certain restricted or limited circumstances, somebody may have an exclusive possession, but he will not be a tenant. So guys, again, I mentioned to you for the students, if you are having an exam, we are saying that your first requirement is to look out for the right of exclusive possession. But also be careful that any time you take into context the right of exclusive possession, it should come with the intention to create legal relations in there. All right? So when you have the right of exclusive possession, and I restate that with the intention to create legal relations, then that right of exclusive possession will be a commencement of a leasehold interest. Are we okay? Let me just add the other second example that he mentioned in there. Lord Templeman also mentioned service occupier. Service occupier. What do you mean by service occupier? Now, a service occupier is somebody who is in occupation of a premises or a land by virtue or in consequence of his employment. He's a service occupier. All right? So, for example, maybe there is some kind of an industrial facility or a land, maybe a timber construction firm and all that. Then um, the owners of the land or the landlord built some structure, some two-bedroom, chamber and hall or something like that on it and puts this security man in there. Okay, so the security man is in occupation as a result of his service to his boss. That is why we call him a service occupier. Okay, he has got a contract of service. He's in unemployment. And in consequence of that employment, he has been given that room. The question, was there an intention to create legal relations or does it, does it, do, does it exist? Or is there a presence of an intention to create legal relations as a relation between a landlord and a tenant? where the person or the tenant would be kind of have an exclusive possession. The answer is no. He is there because of his employment. So if tomorrow something happens and there's a restructuring of the company's business or they, he is dismissed for some kind of um, insubordination or some other um, unprofessional conduct, he ceases to be in occupation. Why? Because his service upon which he was granted occupation has terminated. So when someone is given a premises, okay, he's given a space, or he's using the land in consequence of his employment. Though he may have an exclusive possession, he, he does not, that exclusive possession does not grant to him um, a right of tenancy. All right? So that's the point. A tenant should have exclusive possession, but exclusive possession will not necessarily make someone a tenant because either he may be a trespasser or he may be um, a service occupier. We are cool. All right? So for a lease, Stay, be, be on the lookout and realize that you always need to have the right of exclusive possession in there. 
All right, now let's look at the second requirement. The second requirement for a lease. Now, in the second requirement, it mentions a determinate term. Now, I'll take you back to Lord Templeman's statement, the second one that we took in the street versus Manford. Then we'll just look at the last statement in there. Please, let's just go back to it and just have a brief look at Lord Templeman's statement in street versus Manford. Pay attention onto the last part. It says, To constitute a tenancy, the occupier must be granted exclusive possession for a fixed or periodic term, certain in consideration of a premium or periodical payment. So you saw in that brief part that we mentioned, that is what brings us to the second requirement of a lease. There has to be a determinate, a determinate term. And in the statement there, it says that for a duration that is capable of ascertainment. You remember that in the section, the section 6 of the Lands Act, it mentions that a lease is an interest that is granted to somebody, an individual for land or an interest in land, for a duration that is certain or a duration that is capable of, of ascertainment. Again, you realize that this particular position of the statute is also consistent with what the case law has said in Lord Templeman's statement that we should have a fixed term or a periodic term. So simple. When you have a lease, apart from the right of exclusive possession, the other necessary uh, indication or necessary requirement is that it should be for a known duration, for a fixed duration. So sometimes, as it is done in our part of the country, some people may go for a land. When they go for the land, the land, they will give him the land title document or whatever. They prepare a lease for him. Now in the lease, you may see that the term is there as 99 years lease, 25 years lease, 45 years lease. Now that is a fixed term, which means that we are granting the person the right of exclusive possession for that particular length of period. It is fixed. So that is a requirement. The law is that you cannot grant to somebody an indefinite period or like, like a period that is, um, that is not um, capable of ascertainment. We cannot determine how long the person should be at the facility. You can't do that. When there is such an arrangement, it does not constitute a lease. So there should be a period that is fixed or capable of ascertainment. The, 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 the authorities mention that periodic payments or periodic arrangements or periodic periods, like periodic you know, arrangements like that, that also gives us some capable areas that are capable of, um, or a timeline that is capable of, of, of ascertainment. So for example, the use of a land could be granted to somebody quarterly, okay? Or a premise could be given to somebody quarterly. Okay, so he may be... He may be on it, and the terms will be really looked at every year, every year, every year. I'm sure there are some people who you may know, they take buildings or properties, and after every year, they need to go back and renegotiate their, their stay. Okay? So sometimes, too, they may just tell the person, oh, okay, you can just be in the, in the, in the premise, but maybe after every year, I'll take this amount of money. Until such a time that maybe I want to do something else, and it happens. Just a couple of weeks ago, I was speaking to... Um, um, an, an artisan, he was, a, he was a mechanic, what we call a fitter. And a certain man had got some large tract of land. I think he bought it from some other rich businessman. Now the man intends trying to, con trying to construct on it some office complex. He is yet to commence the office complex. All right. And he got the land about three years ago. So you know what? He told this, this mechanic to just be on the land. He would take some kind of money from him. But as to when he would... Um, he will, he will have to move. He will tell him. Okay, but every three months, he has to give him some kind of money. But you see, he has not actually made him know the exact time that arrangement is going to end. So the question is that, is that a, a, a period that is capable of ascertainment? That is what we mean by a periodic arrangement. It's periodic. He has not actually given him a timeline, right? All right, though. But we know that after every three months, there is going to be a need for that arrangement to be revisited. That is principally what we are trying to say. So if you have a fixed period, okay, if you have a fixed period, 99 years, 10 years, 25 years, and all that, that is a determinate, a determinate, a determinate term, okay? Or it is periodic in the sense that we can give the person every month, two months, three months, quarterly, every year, let's come back and talk about it or something like that. Any of those two streams of arrangement will constitute a determinate term. That is the requirement for, um, uh, uh, um, for, 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 for a lease, to, for, for um, a right of exclusive possession and land to be considered as a lease. 
So in the case, in, 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 a, in a common law case, in a common law case, I think um, one of the British cases, all right, there was an arrangement where the person had granted or purported to grant a lease to somebody during the First World War. And he said that the, the arrangement that they had granted to the person or the lease was for the duration of the war. Now, when the matter went to court, the court held that that didn't constitute a determining term. When you say it is for a duration of the war, what, what exactly do you mean? It's indefinite. So we don't really know whether the war is going to take five years, six years, 10 years, 11 years, 15 years. So once it creates an uncertainty of period, it has not constituted a determinate term, and such an arrangement cannot constitute a lease. Remember, if it is not a lease, the person is not a tenant. Are we okay? So these are kind of the requirements. As we go, we have to be careful with that. So for example, for practical purposes, someone goes and he wants to get a land from somebody, then the person will say, okay, you use the land. You use the land, um, but you, you, you'll be there. Be there, as in, <laughs> for, for what duration? It has to be specific. So once we cannot put a finger on, or we are not able to keep up, we are not capable of ascertaining the exact duration, it doesn't really fit into the, 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 the requirement or the criteria or the elements that are required to establish a lease. And therefore, that arrangement does not constitute a lease. Since it doesn't constitute a lease, the person who is the beneficiary of that is not a tenant. He, he has not got tenancy. Hope you understand that. So again, the students, take note of that. All right. So now that we are done with the second requirement of, of, of the lease being the determining term, let's look at the third requirement. Okay. So I mentioned the third requirement here. Now, the third requirement, and I use third requirement advisedly, I will say is the rent or terms and conditions that include rent. And I will use advisedly. Please pay attention to this. It's very, it's very necessary. You see, leases are usually commercial arrangements. They are commercial arrangements. They are arrangements that people do because of economic or commercial gain. And it is a firm principle in commercial law that basically commercial agreements are just follow the simple idea of contract. And for every contract, there has to be an offer, there has to be an acceptance, then there has to have to call a consideration. The consideration will be in a form of any forbearance or benefit that one of the parties will want to give, okay, such that it kind of constitutes a bargain, all right? So because it is a kind of a commercial arrangement, the necessary feature that comes with all commercial agreements is that there has to be some form of consideration. So the rent that is usually paid constitutes what we call a consideration. Are you understand that? So that is what we mean by um, 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 the rent. So that's where the rent comes in. Once you have the perspective or we look at a lease like a commercial agreement, then that aspect of the consideration will have to come in. And that consideration will be paid in the form of a rent. That is a usual thing. So mostly you would see that at the commencement of the period, okay, at the time that the lease is going to start, the lessee, the person who is being granted that lease or eventually becomes a tenant, or, for example, make some kind of lump sum payment. If it is 1,000 Ghana cities, 20,000 Ghana cities for two years, he will make that kind of payment, lump sum. Okay? Then the lease will commence. Now, that kind of lump sum payment, here in our local plan, usually call it advance. The person has paid some kind of advance. That is a consideration that he has provided. Now, the proper word in law is called it's a premium. So when a lease is granted for a premium, it means that the person has made some payment for advance. That is a, the, the lump sum payment that he makes at the very beginning and it goes there. So that is an arrangement that can be done. There are some kinds of other arrangements, okay, which involves payment of rent. And the rent will be monthly or let's say a year. Okay, so at the end of um, every year, the person will pay 1,000 Ghana cities, you pay that, you pay that, you pay that. It will be in the terms of agreement and conditions that they mention. That is there. So that is a rent. Some other forms of leases will combine the two. The person will take a lump sum, then at the end of every year, he would pay some kind of amount of money. You understand that? So that combination is also there. You take a lump sum, then at the end of every year, as every stipulated period, you're making some kind of payment. Sometimes the reason why this is done is that maybe the lump sum payment will be too huge for the person to pay. So the landlord will deliberately or intentionally take some reasonable amount at the, very, at the, at the earliest stage of the commencement of the lease. Then in other periodic means, he would allow the person to, to, to kind of make those kind of payments. So anyway, 
since that consideration is there, it becomes a requirement, sort of a usual thing for leases to have considerations there because they are commercial agreements. But it's important to realize, and again, I'll take you to the section six. Please just pay attention to the section six of the last act, the A and the B part. C. Let's just go back to that. Section six of the Lands Act. Let's it's an interest in land for a duration which is certain or capable of being ascertained. Arises when a person who holds an alluvial title, customary law freehold, common law freehold, or usufactory interest conveys to another person for a specified term subject to terms and conditions. And it goes on and on and on. Now, guys, did you see the section six? Now, if you look at the Lands Act carefully and you go to the section six, you realize that there is no express provision of rent there. You see that? You look at the section six carefully from the A, B, C part. It never mentions rent. What, what is the import? So this is what it means in law. Okay, What it means is that because leases are commercial agreements, the usual thing is that rents have to be paid. But a rent may not necessarily be or it's not necessary in constituting a lease. You understand that? A rent may not necessarily be, may not be necessary in constituting a lease. So it is a usual thing that, of course, if someone has granted you some um, lease, okay, if it's commercial in nature, there has to be a consideration. So that is what is going to now bring in the concept of the rent being paid as a consideration. But it is also possible for a lease to be granted, okay, where the fixed amount of rent is also not paid. And that is supported by several authorities. Okay? I'll give you one, one case here. In the British case of um, Ashburn Anstalt versus Arnold. Okay? So in there, there was a kind of a leasehold interest that was created for, between the parties. And what happened was that the landlord or the, les the lessor granted the person a rent free. He told him that he was not going to make him pay any kind of rent. But he granted him exclusive possession, okay, until a specified time where he said he would give him notice for him to evict the place. When the matter went to court, the, the, the courts of the land under the common law also agreed that that constituted, that was, those were terms in there. So that constituted, um, 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 or that constituted a lease, okay, because the right of exclusive possession was there and there was a certain, a certain duration and the terms were that he was not going to allow him to pay any kind of rent on it or, or rent free it's just that the condition was that when he wanted to let him vacate he was going to specifically also give him notice to cause him to leave so the court held that 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 was fine in several other cases too it has been held by the house of lords of uk the house of lords that's the uk supreme court that the the rent may not necessarily be a feature of a lease you understand that? So when you put all together and you look at the position of the Lands Act 1036 as we have in Ghana, we do not have rent as being a kind of um, an express provision in the, in, the, in, the, in the statute. Okay, But obviously, if you go to the other sections where we have the implied covenant, okay, they have to call the implied covenant on the transferee on the transfer if by our statute there is an there is an implied covenant that the person will have to pay rent okay the person have to pay rent so there could also be the argument that by virtue of the implied covenants that are that are within or that are provided within the lands act 1036 under Ghanaian under Ghanaian law it is not possible for you to leave somebody a property without the person paying rent that will be the Ghanaian position because the payment of rent is a kind of an implied covenant that is also attached into the statute but if you are looking at it on, on, a, on a broader level, both within the common law jurisdiction, it is possible for a lease to be granted, okay, without necessarily being rent being paid. But for our unique Ghanaian position, we have the payment of rents being, the, the, being an implied covenant in the last act. So even though the section six may not mention it, someone can refer to the obligation or the covenant to pay rent in the last act, which is an implied covenant, and a covenant that is implied into any lease agreement that you do, even if you don't expressly mention it, to say that the payment of rent becomes a critical or necessary feature for, um, for, for, for leases. So essentially, that is what we mean by leasehold interest. The, 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 the key importance of all this discussion that we've had for the student is this. Please, again, like I tell you, if you have questions that pertain to leases, you should know what are the constraints of a lease. The right to exclusive possession, that is the right of the tenant or the lessee to use the property 
in a manner that he can consider as his own, to the exclusion of the landlord. Even though there may occasionally be some rights that will be reserved by the landlord for certain maintenance and etc. Generally, that right of exclusive possession will grant um, 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 will commence the, 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 the view that it is, it is coming into a lease. Then we're also talking about the certainty of duration. Okay, so the time should be certain and it should also be capable of ascertainment. But when you have oral grants, where sometimes in communities, they may grant a land to somebody and they'll say, okay, and when the first moon arrives or for let's say three or four farming seasons, these are the terminologies that we use in our customary parlance to refer to lands that are granted for farming purposes. The point is that here we, in some communities, they still use the moon as a way of ascertaining duration, okay? Some other places to they use the farming seasons, the three farming seasons. So they know the farming season, they know when it ends. If you live in the community or you are seized with understanding of the customary processes or farming processes, you understand what a farming, a farming season means. So if it is capable of ascertainment, as we are seeing, it, it becomes a, a necessary aspect or a necessary um, um, condition uh, or a part of the elements of the leases. Then we also mention other terms which will also include the payment of rent. So when you have all these three as a student, you analyze that the, 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 the lease has been created. We end by saying finally that, you see, when the lease is created, it makes the person a tenant. And we are saying that tenancy operates like a legal estate. When I say it operates as a legal estate, which means the tenant has a right to enforce, okay, enforce any rights or claims against third parties. So if someone goes there, he doesn't need to go and mention the landlord because he has a lease. He can take him to court. He can use the lease to go and procure as a collateral, to procure a loan, to do so many things. That is what we mean that you can enforce it against a third party. But if you don't have a lease, you are not a tenant. You at best be a licensee or something else. And a licensee cannot, cannot do that. So basically, that's what we mean by leasehold interest. Okay? Good. So in our subsequent discussions, as you will see, we will also look at what then flows after we've been able to grant a lease and the person has become a tenant, we will discuss the subject of covenants. Stay tuned.